Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of Mission Report. Once again, I'm your host, Tyler Nelson, and we've got a good one today. We'll be talking to Andrew Cousins about his mission in the Philippines. Thanks to everyone who listened to episode one. If you haven't had a chance yet, go back and check it out. Elijah twice shares his amazing experience about serving in the Provo, Utah mission. He has some great advice and had some awesome stories. And now we've got some more. So without any further ado, here is the second episode of Mission Report. Okay, let's get started. If you want to just take a second and introduce yourself. Sure. So my name is Andrew Cousins. I, uh, I'm from Utah, but I served my mission in the Philippines. I served in the Legaspi mission in the Philippines. Um, so I served from 2018. I left January 3rd, 2018. And I got back from my mission December 18th, 2019. So I only had one Christmas in the mission. It was really cool. I felt really happy about huh. that. That's fine. Yeah, they just don't send missionaries home over Christmas, and so they sent me home two weeks early. I was really happy about that, so was my mom. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, that's me. Good. Might have been a bit of a shock going from the Philippines back to Utah. Yeah, it was really cold. We actually, so we left from the Philippines to Tokyo. Tokyo was like, I think, 40 degrees, (laughs) and then we came to Utah, and it was 20, and we were just like, it was just so cool. It slowly got colder. <laughs> yeah, it was really bad. We went to Portland too. Portland was like 20, 30 as well. It was just, we were like, oh my gosh. So I'm coming home with my short sleeve. Actually, I have my long sleeves on. No, I had a suit made in the Philippines because it's just super cheap to get things mm-hmm. made there. And so I had a suit made and I actually wore that home. So I was kind of warm, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> Shuffle from the plane to the yeah. car. <laughs> cool. Luckily, I didn't get sent home with COVID. I got to finish my mission. So my parents were able to meet me in the airport. That was really nice. Cool. That's nice. Yeah. So many people got... The, all of the American missionaries in the Philippines got sent home from COVID. They had an entire plane filled with missionaries. Really? Yeah. And so they're all singing hymns on the way home and all the flight attendants were like, oh, this is so great. I love having missionaries on the plane. So. Uh-huh. That's cool. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, all right, let's go back to the beginning. Um, why did you choose to serve a mission? Why did you serve a mission? Right. So my reason for serving a mission changed, obviously, as most people do, as they continue on in their mission. I started just going because it was what the prophet told me to do. And I knew that if I was obedient to the prophet, I would like, have blessings and whatnot. I also went because my parents wanted me to. So it wasn't the greatest reason to go on a mission, but I went, and it was the re- it was the right thing to do, and so I'm happy I did it. Um, but as I continued on in my mission, the reason I stayed was because I loved having the Spirit with me. I loved having the Spirit direct my work, and just knowing that I was doing what Heavenly Father wanted me to do made me feel really happy inside. So kind of selfish reasons, but I really liked serving the people as well. So <laughs> that's awesome. I feel like that's more common than people think. Mm-hmm. That was going out. And- like, oh, I'm still not sure, but then you get out there and this is really cool. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. Wouldn't trade it for the world, obviously. Awesome. So. Cool. So you put your papers in, um, got your call. What did you think when you stopped <laughs> So I had, <laughs> it was kind of funny, we went down to my grandma's house. I was at BYU at the time. My parents had the call, so they had it for a week before I did. And then we go to my grandparents' house in Alpine, and <laughs> my girlfriend's there. My ex-girlfriend showed up with my family, so that was super fun. Oh. My girlfriend's actually my wife now, so we'll talk about that. But uh, I open the call, slide the paper back really fast. The first thing I see are passport applications. So I was like, I'm going out of, out of the country. All right, let's go. Uh, and then I slowly slid the, slid the page down so I could read line by line. I saw Philippines, Legaspi Mission, um, Tagalog speaking, and I actually said Tagalog, and my dad was like, that's not how you pronounce it, Tagalog, and I'm like, I don't know, I just, I just read it, so I was super happy, my mom started crying, because she was like, the Philippines is a dangerous country, there's terrorists and whatnot there, and I was like, I haven't heard anything about the Philippines, I'm psyched, let's go, I'm so excited, uh, it was really cool though, because my cousins, they got mission calls right before I did, they got called to serve where their dad and our uncle went, so I was like, okay, I'll stay somewhere in the family, they both went South American speaking, Basically, everybody in my family has gone Spanish-speaking. There's a couple on my mom's side that didn't, and one on my dad's side that didn't. But everybody else who served has basically gone South American. And I got called to the Philippines. I was like, what the heck? It turns out my grandpa was stationed there when he was in the Navy. And so I was like, okay, cool. I, I still have some family connections. Then my wife's grandfather actually was a zone leader over the entire island of 
Luzon in the Philippines. And so he served in the Philippines. So I was like, fair enough. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Cool. Yeah. That's fun to find connections like yeah, that. Yeah, it was really cool. Okay. A lot of people, if they dig far enough, there's, there's always something. There's definitely always a connection. So when you were in your papers getting your call, did you, did you do anything to prepare for your mission? Not as much as I should have. I got in the MTC, I was like, well, I really should have done a little bit more. But I mean, I took mission prep uh, here at BYU, and it was super awesome. My teacher was great. I read the Book of Mormon. May or may not have finished Alma 12 to the end in three nights because I need to finish it for the mi for the mission prep class. But I did it, and I read the Book of Mormon before I left. Super awesome. I think I still have the copy somewhere. I'm not sure, but I just had to highlight it in colors corresponding to the Preach My Gospel lesson. So that was really cool. Um, but other than that, I really didn't do a whole lot besides go to the temple a lot. I tried to go to the temple every week. Um, went to church, like just kept on doing the same things that I'd always been doing. Just keeping, yeah. Probably should have researched about the country more. That's probably what I would do again. If I were to go on a mission again, I would research about the country. Um, and maybe do a little bit more reading and preach my gospel, but I didn't do a whole lot. Huh. But that's still... I did something. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. That's good. Uh, which MTC did you go to? So I actually went to two MTCs. I went to the Provo MTC for six weeks to learn the language. Super awesome experience. And then I went to the Manila MTC for five days just to like get visas and get acclimatized to the country before sending us out into the field. Um, so both MTCs were really cool. And yeah, I went to both of them. So, and I guess just the next question is what was the MTC like? Um, so the Provo MTC was super cold. And I didn't bring a suit or long sleeves. I just had my short sleeves because that's all I was told to bring in there. I was like, okay, well, yeah. But it was super cold, super fun. Everybody hated the food. I loved the food. I thought the food was great. Because, I mean, I had just come from Helium and Halls with the Cannon Center. Mm -hmm. And then the MTC uses the same food. So I was just continuing eating the same stuff. Um, really liked exercise time. Exercise time was a lot of fun. Um, my teachers were amazing. Um, when you first come into MTC, right, they have you teach an investigator like an investigator. I thought it was a real investigator because both of my teachers were small and spoke the language fluently. And so I was like, okay, they're just really pale Filipinos. <laughs> okay, this is crazy. I have a freaking brand new missionary. Why are they having me teach a new investigator <laughs> and be in charge of their salvation? And everybody by the end was like, did you really think that? No, everybody knows that they're teachers. I was like, I totally thought that they were, <laughs> that they were a real investigator. Oh, yeah. And so... Uh, that was fun. My district was awesome. We were kind of disobedient in the MTC where every Saturday night you have that blank time to like prepare talks or think about Sunday. We would have family home evening and we would go play games and have a spiritual thought up in one of the rooms and we were just like, that's super disobedient but it's not what we were supposed to be doing. A lot of fun though, so we had, we had fun together. I can I, imagine worse things to do. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> there, we heard stories of worse things, so... Uh, I, kind of, I actually had a couple famous people in my district, which was really cool. Uh, one of the DJs for James the Mormon, he was in my district. Like, he actually produced some music for him. And then a rugby player for UT Arlington was in my district. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just an awesome experience. The Manila MTC was super cool. Beautiful MTC. Unfortunately, the temple was closed when we were there, so I didn't get to go to the Manila temple at the beginning of my mission. I did get to go at the end, which was an amazing experience. But in the Manila MTC, we just got to go be missionaries for a little bit. We got to do our proselyting day, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> I brought this giant bag full of everything that I could have possibly needed, and everybody was like, why are you bringing so much stuff? I had a Tagalog quad, an English quad, uh, snacks, water, sunscreen, bug spray, Basically, anything I could have needed, I had it in this giant bag. And my companion's like, what are you doing? Why do you have so much stuff? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, man. I'm brand new here. you got to be ready. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was really shocking, though. On that pro first proselyting day, I, we went and taught a less active member. And he was just chilling in his house with his garment tops on. And I was like, I didn't know that that was allowed. But okay, <laughs> here we go. Works. So, I mean, it was fine. I didn't really know the language yet, but... I just tag along for the ride. Um, there's a night at the Manila MTC where they feed you very authentic food. And so we had a delicacy called balut, which is... Heard you've this. heard of it. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, like a fertilized duck egg that is like three days from hatching. 
And so it's got the bird in there with feathers, sometimes with a beak, depending on what kind you get. Mm. And you just crack it open and eat it, and it tastes like a hard-boiled egg. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it's good. Uh, we had one sister take like 12 minutes to eat it just because we were trying to egg her on. We were like, you gotta eat it, you gotta eat it. <laughs> and she went to the bathroom and threw it up anyway, so. Ew. Yeah. That was a cool experience. Um, other than that, yeah, MTC was a great experience. I loved it. I wish I could have stayed longer, but I'm glad I got to go to the field eventually. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so how was the language for you? So the language is good. Uh, I learned Tagalog, and the first thing I could do in the MTC was read and understand the Book of Mormon. And that was amazing in Tagalog. Like, I was able to read it and understand it in Tagalog. And that was just one of the most helpful things that could have happened to me because throughout my mission, that was my language study, was studying the Book of Mormon in the language. And I learned it fairly quickly. Once I got out of my first area, I started impressing people with my knowledge of the language. And they're like, how long have you been out? And I was like, I've only been out for four months, six months. So. Uh, it didn't take me too long, but I was really grateful for the help that Heavenly Father gave me with the gift of tongues and whatnot. But it was just an awesome experience learning how to communicate with these people. My first, my first area was really hard. I had two Filipino companions right off the bat. My first one couldn't speak English. Cool. Yeah. And he could speak a little bit, but not fluently and not like anything special. My second one could speak a little bit more English, but I could speak more Tagalog by then. And so I really had a trial by fire and very much instantly immersed into the language. I was in this remote-ish area, in the, almost the northernmost part of the mission, um, and I just immediately had to learn how to speak Tagalog. And I actually had a couple really bad experiences where uh, a couple people took advantage of me and my companion wasn't very honest to me, so. Uh, it was a trial, but by the end of my mission, I was, I'm fluent. I take the classes at BYU, and I just got university certified in the language. So, super awesome, and definitely a blessing to have learned this language. That's cool. Yeah. That's, I don't know if this looks true for everybody in the world, but all of the best speakers in my mission were people who had native companions right off the bat, because mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple principle. You speak it, you learn it. <laughs> speak, speak your language, that's what they say. Yeah. So. Cool. Do you have any funny stories about making language, language mistakes? <laughs> so, one time, this is with, <clears throat> I'm in my second area, fourth companion, I'm training him. He's American. So, I don't know the language. Uh, that's not true. I do know the language, but not fluently. My companion doesn't know any of the language. And now he almost speaks it as good as I do, or better. And so he did amazing work. Um, and that's an example of a native, a non-native companion being able to teach a non-native companion. So... There is hope for everybody out there. Um, but we're talking to this lady. We're just like street contacting and knocking on doors. We're trying to get into some houses. And I'm talking to this lady about food, just because that's something you talk to people about. And we're talking about barbecue. And the word for barbecue in Tagalog is ihao. And so you say something about barbecue and food. You say, ini ihao mo bayen. And that means, did you barbecue that? Is that how you cook it? And I accidentally said, ini ihi mo bayen. And that means, did you pee on it? <laughs> and so she was like, uh, and I was like, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, no, I meant e house. So <laughs> it was just really funny, a little mix up right there. Um, what else? Pretty sure I said pusa instead of puso, and puso is heart, pusa means cat. <laughs> and so obviously there's a little bit of mix up there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are just really funny. Uh, yeah, those are my two. Those are funny. That's yeah. That's a really fun to look back on. Mm -hmm. They're not so fun in the moment sometimes. No. <laughs> cool. Well, speaking of food, um, let's talk about the Philippines itself a little bit. Start with food. How's the food there? Where is it? Delicious. It's so good, but it's super simple. Every recipe starts with the same, like, three ingredients. It's chicken, garlic, and soy sauce. And then usually there's a fourth potatoes. Like, those four ingredients are basically the base for everything. And then rice. You eat rice three meals a day, seven days a week, if you're a Filipino. And I was sick of it by the end. Mm -hmm. So much rice. Oh my gosh. Um, but their main dish is called adobo, and it's just chicken, potatoes, onion, garlic, soy sauce, and vinegar, and pepper. And it is one of the most flavorful dishes you will ever have. It's so good. 
Uh, another one is chicken curry. They have their own version of curry, and it's really good. It's actually my wife's favorite food, so I cook that for her a lot. Um, but a lot of just kind of like soupy meals with potatoes and broth and chicken that you throw on top of rice. Everything goes on top of rice. For breakfast, you have hot dogs and eggs and rice, and you throw all that together. And just, well, you throw it on a plate separately, but then you eat it however you want. Um, for lunch, you usually have some, like leftovers from the day before or more adobo. Um, for dinner, usually something pretty big and pretty substantial with potatoes and chicken. So you're always full. It's just always the same thing. And so it's like, uh, adobo again? All right, fine. Uh, if you get into the poorer regions, you'll get a lot of dried fish and rice. <laughs> Lots of dried fish. Um, seafood's a big thing if you're next to the ocean just because you can go out and fish it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I had little tiny crabs one time, cooked in coconut milk. Coconut milk's also a big thing. They've got a bunch of coconuts. I didn't like coconut before I left on the mission. I realized that I don't like fake American coconut. I like fresh coconut straight off the tree because then I can just open it by myself. And I, I bought a machete and I was able to open a coconut by the end of my mission. It's so much fun. Um, yeah. Rice is a big one. Coconut is a big thing. Mangoes. They're religiously proud of their mangoes. It's like, if it's not from the Philippines, it's not a mango. Um, and so they have this really good dessert called Mango Graham. And it's graham cracker, a layer of homemade Filipino ice cream, which is just cream and sweet condensed milk mixed together. So it's basically ice cream. And then mango, and you just layer that. And that's like a dessert cheese or dessert lasagna. So good. It's so good. You have that a lot around Christmas time and Easter and New Year's and things like that. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing is there's so much rice. Oh, their spaghetti is sweet. It's not salty or savory like it is here. You can buy that, but Filipinos like it sweet with hot dogs and basically Velveeta cheese. Huh. So, Interesting. yeah. <laughs> the only reason I like it now is because it's from the Philippines and it's nostalgic. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what I used to eat all the time. Mm -hmm. And so they'll have that for every birthday is spaghetti and lumpia, which is like spring rolls. So. Interesting. What's the, what are the Philippines like it's geographically, whether it's kind of an island? Yeah, so it, there's 700 something islands in the Philippines. So there's a bunch, a bunch of small ones. The three main ones are Luzon, Cebu, and Mindanao. Cebu and Mindanao, they speak Cebuano, Luzon speaks Tagalog. Um, I served mainly on the southern portion of Luzon, which had, it, actually the biggest feature of my mission was the Mayon volcano. It's an active volcano. It actually was exploding when I went to the mission. <laughs> it was actually currently erupting. And so we were in the MTC, the Manila MTC, ready to get on our flight in the airport. Were we in the airport? Yeah, we were in the airport, and then our plane just couldn't take off and so they drove us back to the MTC and they're like so what happened our plane couldn't take off they're like so there's actually a volcano exploding in mission right now you're gonna take a bus so we drove 15 hours to our mission which should have only taken us an hour and a half maybe an hour wow. on a plane and so we drove through the night to our mission we got to the mission home and with our dinner thing we went outside and looked at the volcano and there was lava coming out of the volcano is for anybody who's never seen a volcano before, it's not like the movie Pompeii or 2012. It's not explosive. <laughs> Some of them are, sure, but that one was not. Now, that's what I was expecting. I was expecting flaming balls of earth to come out of the sky and crush me. That's what I was expecting. But um, it was just like leaking, kind of like a, just kind of like chocolate sauce or something. So more low key. A little more low key. So there was smoke coming out of it. Uh, I went through a couple of earthquakes. Nothing like any stronger than. 4.0, so one of them shook the house, which was kind of intense. My companion was like, it was my first companion, he was Filipino, so he was used to it. He was like, what are you doing? I was freaking out, and I was standing in the doorway. I was like, this is what I was taught to do. Don't judge me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was in the most rural part of the Philippines, and so a bunch of rice fields. So, like, rice fields as far as the eye can see. Um, uh, a couple of hills, no mountains, like here in Utah or here in America anywhere the biggest one was the volcano and it kind of just looked like a lonely mountain from the Hobbit and just straight up there it was and there was nothing around it at all so that was pretty cool palm trees mango trees uh, I got on a couple beaches 
we had mostly white sand beaches, but there was one place there where there was a black sand beach, and that was pretty cool. So the sand was actually black. Uh, it was really, I didn't know that, it, that exist, existed. Um, and then my last area, my last 10 months of my mission, actually, I served in two areas on a little island off of the main island called Catanduanes. And that one was just a whole lot of fun, super tiny. I got to serve for three months up in the mountains, about three miles, three hours away from anybody else. Wow. So there was nobody nearby. Super small area, but that was up in the mountains. That was a lot of fun. So I guess if you just think tropical island, that's what you think. That's what the Philippines are. Um, I guess since there, you said there's 26 missions, and mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of members in the Philippines? Yes. There are 75 Seven hundred and fifty thousand members in the Philippines, but only about three hundred thousand are active. So pretty similar to the whole world. Like you've got a bunch of members, but a lot of them are less active. Um, you've got two temples right now. A couple more being built. We've got I think six or seven being built in the Philippines. Um, I only served in branches and districts. My mission is one of the newer ones. It was created in twenty thirteen, just because it was too far away from the other mission home to be effective for the mission president to control them as well. Um, so we sir, we had six districts and one stake in my mission. And when I was leaving, we were having talks about creating another stake. Just one of, one of the districts was ready to become a stake almost, and so we were talking about that. But I only served in branches. Uh, my smallest branch had about... Well, actually, my smallest branch, attendance-wise, had about 20 people come every week. My largest branch, attendance-wise, could have been two boards. It was massive, but it just wasn't under a stake, so they couldn't they couldn't do anything about it. Um, so yeah, quite a few members, but most of them were last active. So that was a lot of our work was helping last active members, also while finding people to teach. So, what you use for meeting houses? Did you have like we had actual meeting houses. Yeah, a lot of the times we had established meeting houses. I I was lucky and I got to serve in a lot of those. Uh, there's a couple, there were a couple groups in our missions. They're like, there's stakes, wards, districts, branches, and then under that is a group. And so that's like, they're under the stewardship of a branch, but they're just living too far away for them to be an actual branch. And so they just meet by themselves. They're authorized to do the priesthood or to do, to, to do the sacrament. Um, I never served in a group, but my area that was up in the mountains, three hours away from everybody. Uh, the branch president had actually built a church house for the ward to meet on the back of his house. Cool. So it was just, we just went through his house to go to church most Sundays. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Here's what you got. Yeah. What was your average day? Like? Sure. So our average day, you know, we followed the schedule, wake up 6.30. We would exercise for 30 minutes. Depending on the area, um, <laughs> actually in the beginning of my mission, I was not in shape at all. So I do like... 10 push-ups and I'd be like okay good that, that's enough for me <laughs> um, also my companion would work out so I just wouldn't have a whole lot of motivation to work out um, in other areas we had like a cement homemade bench press system so we got to use that that was a lot of fun uh, a couple missionaries would buy exercise equipment so they would use that and then leave it because they didn't want to cart it around um, but yeah exercise for 30 minutes then we would start getting ready for the day, make breakfast, put rice on, have some hot dogs and eggs. During that, I would read a couple things just because I like reading, so I would pick up, like, Jesus the Christ, and that was still allowed. Um, preach my gospel, Book of Mormon, something that I could just read for a little bit while my companion was in the shower or anything. Um, and for any of you who have heard rumors about the Philippines, yes, they do use bucket showers, and you just pick up a ladle and basically dump yourself with water and then soap up and then dump more water on yourself. Yeah. Freezing cold feels really good because it's super hot but if you wanted to you could boil water to have a hot water shower some missionaries like doing that i didn't care for it I was whatever um there were a couple mission uh, a couple apartments that had running water and they you could you could actually have a shower <laughs> one of the apartments was like stronger than a fire hose and that was <laughs> <laughs> freezing cold water coming at you stronger than a fire hose that was rough um you get clean you, you definitely yeah, <laughs> definitely got clean um, but yeah, we'd get ready for the day around 8.30ish, we would do daily planning, and then we'd do that for a half hour, then we'd do personal study for an hour, we'd go out, 
depending on the area, again, we would go out for about two, three hours, try to do some track training, maybe do some morning lessons and whatnot if we could schedule them. And then we would come back to the house or pack a lunch or eat out, depending on what we had that week for MSF. Um, the Missionary Support Fund, I guess people might not know that. <laughs> um, missionary money. Yeah, missionary money. You just get it loaded onto a cart every week, and it's really helpful. <laughs> uh, so we would go home, have lunch, and then we would do our companionship or langu- and language study if you're learning a language. So we would be in the house for anywhere from two to three hours there. And then after that, we would go out for the evening, and we would track or teach lessons or do anything and everything we could to be a missionary until 9 o'clock, 9.30, and we'd come home, make dinner, get ready for bed, write in our journals, read some more, and then go to bed. So we would always have dinner after tracting. I know some, at least some stateside missions, they'll do it at like 4 o'clock. You have to eat dinner at 4, and I was like, that's not happening. I just barely ate lunch. I am not going to eat at 4 and then not eat again. So we would always do we would always do dinner after. So we would have a very late dinner. Uh, there, you said you ate out sometimes. So what kind of places do you eat out? So when I was talking about the food, that exact same thing. It's just like some mom or some grandma just cooks food and puts it out on her little. She like builds a stand out of bamboo, puts it out. It's like all right, this is fifty pesos. Come and buy some. So. Not the super sanit- most sanitary thing. Can't really trust it a whole lot. But there are more established ones that are actual sit-down restaurants. Don't think sit-down like America. Like, that's the high... McDonald's in the Philippines is high class. Like, that is what you go if you are rich. And, like, know what America is. But, like, they'll have some sit-down just, like, shacks built out of bamboo or, like, little cement walls. And then you can go and sit down look in some heating dishes. And there'll be adobo or curry or they'll have pating sometimes with shark and I've actually had shark, and that was pretty good, yeah. They cooked it in these, like, like this herb leaf and coconut, um, coconut milk. It was actually pretty good. Throw it on rice, it was pretty dang good. Um, but yeah, you just go into a restaurant and sit down and have basically what you would eat if you were cooking at home, rice and food. <laughs> yeah. Even duck eggs and shark. That's yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. How did you feel you became a better teacher to the course of Okay, um, so before your mission, you've like given a talk or two, you've given maybe a lesson in young men's, or you just like say a bunch of things, maybe ask two questions because you're like, you're told, your parents tell you it's good to ask questions in a lesson, so you ask a couple of questions. But what I think I learned over the course of my mission was really learning how to teach people and not lessons. That's one of the sections in Preach My Gospel. You'll become very intimately aware of that section throughout the course of your mission. But I really learned how to plan for people and their needs and like what they needed and really how to use the spirit in teaching. It was really cool to be able to see my lesson plans from the beginning of the mission where I was like, okay, I have to teach A, B, and C, and I have to get through that. To the end of my mission where I was like, okay, we need to teach them this idea, and we have a couple of questions, and this is the commitment we're going to leave them. That was the biggest thing. It was really focusing on that commitment. You're like, you need to read the Book of Mormon. You need to go to church. Um, and then we would plan our lesson around that. So it was really cool to be able to teach people instead of just trying to blindly follow the progress report and teach them the word of wisdom, the law of chastity, all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember planning with my companions too, and, mm-hmm. and they'd say, oh, we should do this, or challenge them to do this. And it drove me crazy, and I couldn't figure out why for a long time. And then President Nelson came along and said something to the effect of good good inspiration is based on good information or something like that. And I was like, ah, that makes sense. You can't, you know, you can't tell somebody to do something if you don't know, if you have to talk to them, if you don't know they need that. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, now I want to give you time if you want to have any experiences that you want to share. Um, funny, spiritual, whatever kind of nature. Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll share two stories. One of them is a funny one. And just for an insight into missionary life, and then one of them is just a really awesome experience that I had near the end of my mission. First one, we call it the Night of the Cockroaches. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> it's just as good as it sounds. So me and my companion, the one, my training companion, who's the American, I was American, we had our apartment, and one night we came home from work, it was like 9 o'clock, dark outside, and one of us had left the window open, which you're not supposed to do, because the bugs will be inside. 
We left the window open just because it was hot. I think I had burned breakfast that morning, so it was a little smoky, so we tried to air it out. <laughs> we get home, and we find 30 cockroaches uh, in our apartment and a couple rats. That one we had found in the course of killing all the cockroaches. We knew they were there. We just didn't know where they were. So we spent about an hour trying to rid our apartment of these cockroaches. And my companion, he put on his massive church boots that he had bought just for like walking so he didn't have to buy new shoes mm -hmm. he put on these we call them his clompers after that just because he started stomping on them and then he grabbed a broom st tied his tie around his head just like a knee fight and then just started going ham at him just <laughs> whacking him stomping on him uh and then he started bathing our apartment he actually basically baptized our apartment in permethrin which is an insecticide that the mission gives us and Oh, that night was so nasty. We'd close all the doors so they wouldn't get anywhere else. We opened the one door so they would get outside. Um, but I was trying to do follow-up reporting that time during that time. And so my companion, he was trying to kill all the guy, all the cockroaches. And I was like, sisters, what are your numbers? I was freaking out. I was trying to call the sisters, trying to call the APs. You could probably hear him in the background. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then one of the cockroaches started running up the wall. It was one of the last ones. And my companion was like, Elder, watch out. The cockroach flew down and hit me in the cheek, and I freaked out. Oh, it was, ugh, it was nasty. So that took about two hours. I, I don't think we got to bed until 11.30 that night because we were trying to clean up and trying to kill these cockroaches, trying to do reporting, writing our journals. That night was insane. And then we, just, we had a couple of couches, so we threw those out because that's where the rats were. Mm -hmm. And, oh, man, it was ugh, so nasty. Yeah. So many cockroaches. I couldn't imagine that. Yeah, so. it was so bad. Um, but that was, that was a night I probably will never forget. Um, uh, and then the really cool experience is, uh, my last area, it was actually, so I actually got to go back to this area. I served in it twice. Um, so I was a zone leader there and then I got put on a special assignment up in that area in the mountains and then brought back to the same area to be a zone leader again. And while I was gone, my companion my old companion, he had another companion that I came back with that, to that same companion. They had found the week before a family to teach. And this family, we taught them as a family, like all four of them. It was a mom, dad, and two sons, which is really rare to be able to teach the mom, dad, and the children at the same time. And you, you have to get really lucky, and the spirit has to be there, and they just have to be ready at that time. So we got to teach this family. He found them a couple weeks before. They actually had his same last name. And so it was really cool to be able to teach. His name was Other Vargas, and we got to teach the Vargas family. And I got to see them go from new investigator all the way to recent convert to active member because I was there for three months. And so they got baptized four weeks after I got to the area. They had come to church once before, and then they kept coming. And so in the Philippines, you have to go four times to church out of six weeks to be able to be considered for baptism just so that, they're, you, that the church knows that you can come to church with, on your own. You don't have to have people give you rides or pay for you or anything. Um, and so we taught them, and it was an amazing experience to be able to teach them all the lessons. My companion was really thorough. He wanted to make sure that it was done right. And so the week before he left the area, they got to get baptized, all four of them on the same day. Uh, it was beautiful. And he got to baptize them because, I mean, he was, shared their last name. He found them, and I was like, it's yours, man. I, <laughs> you can be, you can absolutely do their baptism. That'd be that's all yours. But after that, he left. I had to bring in an American companion, so it was two Americans getting to teach them, and we just became best friends with them. I still I talk to a couple of them to this day. I, I not all of them have phones; so they can't always get on Facebook. But their sons have Facebook, so I talk to them uh, fairly often. They just they have been adopted into the ward. They're part of them now. It's. If I were to be able to go back to the Philippines, I would. That would probably be one of my first stops. Would be to go visit that family, just because I got to see them go from these just these investigators and these friends who just ask the most random questions, like why did Jesus have to ride on a donkey, or like just these random questions that you expect from recent converts that you're or from investigators that you're teaching the first time the gospel, and getting to see them go to all right, I'm ready to be baptized, like. Let's do this today. We're like, no, you can't go today. You can't do it today. You have to go to church one more time. So it, that was uh, very good friends. I was really sad to see them go. Many tears were shed when I said goodbye to them for the last time. So that was amazing. 
That's what we want. I think. That's yeah. those friendships and mm-hmm. meet people. Like, so much more than just baptizing people. Yeah. Like you gotta it, like they started saying you teach repentance to baptize converts. Like it used to be baptize everybody, go forth and baptize. But now they're really putting an emphasis on teaching repentance and baptizing converts. Because you want them to be converted before they get baptized. You want them to bring forth the fruits of repentance worthy of baptism. So it was really cool to be able to see everything fall into place. Just like the prophets said. Just like all of the modern prophets have said. If you do this, this, and this, they will be converted. And you will be happy. And like, yeah, it was, that was probably the most fulfilling experience of my entire life. Alrighty, well, last question for today is, would you have any advice for anybody who is preparing to serve a mission or has a call to go out? Read the Book of Mormon, obviously. Read it every day. Make a habit of reading it. Um, do everything that you're supposed to do. Go to church. Go to the temple. Go to the temple as much as possible. Uh, read Preach My Gospel. All the things that you know to do is what you should do. I don't know if I have any specific advice for them. But just be ready to be on the Lord's errand. And that's it for our second episode of Mission Report. Just like last time, if you liked it, please share it. Mission Report is available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and soon it'll be up on Apple Podcasts. If you want to follow us and see pictures from the mission of the people I'm interviewing, follow us on Instagram. Coming up next week, I'll be interviewing Caitlin Palmer about her mission in Brazil, so stay tuned. Special thanks this week to everyone who gave feedback on last week's episode. It really helped. To Troy Giebel, our composer, and to Andrew Cousins for doing a great interview. I hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll see you next week.